Welcome, welcome. My name is Jeffrey Palermo and I'm your host for today's webinar. We're going to be diving into why Agile and DevOps don't fix a failing project. Um, and this, this webinar is geared for the leadership audience who are running software projects. Uh, I think we have a, a few developers here. Welcome. Um, everyone is welcome to any of our webinar topics. But uh, this one, this one is at the leadership level, how to make our teams successful and what to look for uh, if uh, maybe maybe the, the team and the project is not going towards success and so that we can course correct. Um, but, you know, at the executive level, uh, if you look at your financial reports, every time you look at them month over month, you're reminded of how expensive operating a software engineering team is. And you know, on top of that, you know the software team is absolutely necessary. You need to do the software project, but your gut tells you that you should be able to deliver faster with fewer production disruptions and a, a better, that is a lower bug rate. And you know, your team works really hard, often working late on weekends, you see the effort, but the project's just not progressing like it needs to. So this webinar is going to focus on that and touch on why, why, although good things to do, Agile and DevOps alone don't guarantee success and they don't fix a project that is already heading towards failure. A little bit about ClearMeasure. Um, ClearMeasure is a software engineering firm and development partner serving companies struggling with business critical software projects. And when failure is not an option, we guarantee your success. Uh, we offer a guarantee, so you can find us at clearmeasure.com. And along with executing projects or executing part of a project, we also serve as third-party inspectors, third-party outside auditors, and we also have um, software team advisement programs. So our goal is to empower software delivery however, uh, however you need to execute it. Quick free offer. Um, if you send me an email, I'll send you a, a, a free electronic copy of my latest book, .NET DevOps for Azure. And you can also find some of our other mini books at clearmeasure.com slash developers slash books. Um, and uh, you can send me an email or you can just put a request in the chat and Chloe is helping in the chat uh, funnel those. And if there's any questions, you can use the uh, you can use the the, the Q and A window in the Zoom software as well as we go along. And I'm pretty good at uh, answering questions as we go along. But my commitment to you is we won't close the webinar until all of the questions have been answered. All right. Um, if you're not aware, or maybe maybe some of the developers on your team um, are listeners of my podcast, the Azure the Azure DevOps podcast. We cover uh, all topics, Azure and DevOps and .NET, and basically shipping software using everything that the Microsoft uh, platform has to offer. So you can find that uh, on any of the podcast directories. And we'll reference some of the tools and resources available to us as part of our uh, Clear Measure Way bundle of offerings. Again, uh, we want your software team, your software organization to be highly effective because we believe that when equipped and trained properly, every team can deliver world-class results. All right, so let's dive into to, to Agile and DevOps. And um, after, well, at this point in time with the 2015 chaos report, uh, that was over a decade of Agile adoption. And the Standish Group did a study and they reported in their 2015 study that projects using Agile did succeed on, on average at a rate three times better than waterfall projects. So yay, awesome, this sounds like some great progress, and it is, but it's not the whole story. Um, and, and, and they've done some good work, and, and they've also done a follow-up addition to the study for 2020, which has an interesting finding, which I'll share a little bit later on in the, in the webinar. Um, so Agile projects, uh, you know, although with the progress, were still only deemed successful 39% of the time across all project sizes. And, uh, you know, if we look at the segment of small projects, okay, it, it does jump up to 58% uh, 
Um, but in the small projects, you know, waterfall even succeeds 44% of the time. Uh, it, you know, experience tells us that the smaller the project, the easier it is to succeed in the first place, even if you don't even have a clear methodology. Small, smaller projects are easier, hard, uh, large projects are, are harder, a lot more risky. So a logical question is, uh, and we, we should ask, why don't we just do small projects then? Why don't we refuse to do big projects? And, and that's a good question, you know, to ponder a little bit philosophical and how did we get into this big project in the first place, if that's the, if that's the situation you're in. Um, but, you know, overall, our industry has a poor track record. And so we need to understand how to spot a project that is failing and spot it right away so that we can stop it, so we can fix it, so we can course correct it. And so we see that while Agile is better for projects, it still only succeeds around 25% of the time for medium or for the larger projects, okay? Um, so the the definition of success, by the way, in the, in the in the Standish Group's report is a combination of three factors, on time, on budget, and on target. And it's really important to, to add the on target because it means it accomplished the objectives that it was set out to do. Um, it, it, actually, it actually met the business outcomes that we're invested in. So what does a failing project look like? It's actually pretty simple to see. It's late, it's over budget, and the software is just not right. However you want to frame it, it's, it's slow, it's buggy, um, it, it, it doesn't work the way that it was requested, it's not actually getting the outcome that you wanted it to get. Uh, and, and, and by the way, even if every feature that was envisioned works the way that the particular feature was designed to work, if the outcome isn't there, the, soft, the project's not a success. Because as we'll see later, features, the list of features is only a hypothesis for how we might come to an outcome. And we might not be right. Um, now, these these three these three uh, criteria are pretty far reaching, um, and you know n nobody really can afford to wait until the full project schedule has elapsed before knowing if the project is going to be late or over budget. We need to put the project on a path for success right away and keep it there. Um, and and you know, agile and DevOps do kind of offer some improvements and we want to be able to capture those, but also see what Agile and DevOps cannot do. Now, let's, let's review what the manifesto for Agile software development actually is. It's published in 2001 with a simple website that's still up, agilemanifesto.org. And um, if, if your group is, is implementing Agile, then they should definitely be trained and know what's on this website. It's a set of four value statements and 12 principles. And you know, a, a simple conversation with a lot of managers in the industry um, who are overseeing software groups and, and use Agile ends up revealing a very shallow and partial implementation of the values and principles, regardless of what flavor of process, whether Scrum or extreme programming or uh, elements of Kanban, uh, the the values and principles are what define Agile. Just a suggestion, as an exercise, ask one of your peers in the industry, what part of Agile have you implemented so far? And you're probably gonna hear things like, um, we use iterations or, or, or sprints, we use retrospectives, we prioritize a backlog and so forth. But, but what you'll find is it's rare, it's more rare, in other words, less than 50%, that you see all of the Agile values and principles fully implemented. And that's a huge missed opportunity for a methodology which is proven to improve the success rates. It alone doesn't guarantee success for your project, but you see in the data, okay, it's an improvement. But in order to capture even that improvement, you actually have to use it fully as opposed to just you know maybe bundle your rhythm of delivery into two or three weeks label it a sprint and say 
that you are implementing the the four agile values and the 12 principles. Um, and so let's be reminded of what, what agile is. Invo um, valuing individuals and interactions over processes and tools, uh, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. That fourth one, that's really hard for a lot of people because, um, because management wants to see a plan, wants to approve a plan and outside parties want to know how much is being invested and what they're going to get. And, and, and instead, uh, if we, if we say we're choosing agile, well, guess what? We're intentionally saying, if we learn something new, we are going to respond to what we learn and we're going to change something when we learn it. And guess what? That plan is going to change. Now the 12, principles, those go into, into, into more detail. And the first one is continuous delivery of valuable software. Satisfy the customer. In other words, serve whoever you've deemed to serve through early and continuous, meaning all the time, delivery of valuable software. And um, that doesn't mean ship a bill to the testing team, to the product management team. It means to the customer. Welcome changing requirements. And again, deliver working software frequently. Business people and developers working together instead of having handoffs. Uh, building projects around motivated individuals, giving them the environment and support that they need. Recognizing that the most efficient and effective method to convey information is direct face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and of course, even if you're remote, video, video calls direct face-to-face -face and not just emails or tickets. Um, Making sure that as you're measuring progress, you're measuring working software, not just activity. And then sustainable development, always being sustainable, not you know death marches, not working nights and weekends, that's not sustainable. And then technical excellence, number nine, there's so many teams that lack the attention to technical excellence and good design. And then 10, kind of counterintuitive, simplicity is essential, meaning maximizing the amount of work not done, meaning getting creative and saying, you know, we can accomplish that objective. We don't actually need to do this. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do this. Okay. And then 11 is self-organizing teams um, and, and putting all the right people in the team. And then 12 is where retrospectives come from at regular intervals, uh, tune and adjust, not just, not just, uh, you know, lament or talk about the problems, but actually tune and actually adjust um, and be empowered to do so. Now, what is DevOps? Um, you know, there's been a number of people who've written about the more informal history of the dawn of DevOps because there is no devopsmanifesto.org website like there is with uh, the manifesto for agile software development. It's a little bit more informal. Um, but, you know, there's a, a video online by Damon Edwards and he provides a, a quick overview um, and uh, we can we can share that if anyone's interested, but it's, it's pretty easy to search online. Uh, in, in short, there was a, a group of people, um, a group of people who were unhappy about how servers and infrastructure were being treated while code had moved to shorter iterative cycles because of the adoption of, of that principle of Agile. And so at the O'Reilly Velocity Conference in 2009, two gentlemen, John Allspaw and Paul Hammond, from Flickr, which is you know, owned by Yahoo, uh, presented a presentation called 10 Deploys in a Day, Dev and Ops Cooperation at Flickr. And then later, um, someone who, um, who connected with them, Patrick Dubois, organized a conference named DevOps Days, uh, but his original name for the conference was gonna be Agile System Administration. So the origin of DevOps was conversations figuring out how to apply agile principles to system administration. But he thought that that title was a little bit clunky and, uh, and, and dev and ops were kind of put together. Uh, but from the beginning, DevOps is an extension of the agile movement and establishes ways to apply the agile values and principles to systems infrastructure and servers and all that. Um, it's not a replacement of Agile or a competitor. 
it's the application of agile to servers and infrastructure and network and cloud and all that. So um, you know, this enables us to speak more simply about these prominent buzzwords and what they actually are. Um, so let's talk about why all projects that use them don't succeed. And it's because of leadership. Um, and you as the ones attending this webinar, you are leaders. So yeah, it kind of comes back to you. Agile and by extension DevOps has a solution for communication and alignment and quality and stability and team effectiveness, but to put them in place and reinforce them takes leadership. So, you know, there's a lot of teams that have disengaged executive oversight um, and the teams might report that they're using Agile, but it's a name only. They might report that they've adopted DevOps, but it's a name only. And then, uh, you know, an executive that's, that's not so engaged is kind of left to conclude that because of this and because the project's not really going like they wanted it to, that, okay, Agile and DevOps don't work. Well, in reality, they weren't actually applied or they were applied in a very partial manner, um, you know, in a, in a more shallow sense. And so in that case, it's kind of to be expected. Back in 2001, Agile was radically different and it's still actually radically different today and still difficult to apply today because it, it kind of fights traditional organizational structures in a lot of cases, it can affect almost the whole organization. It's hard to do. It ruffles feathers. So if, you know, if the agile adoption has, quote, happened without causing any kind of turmoil in other parts of the organization outside the software team, then it probably hasn't actually happened. And agile probably hasn't actually been adopted. And you should investigate into that. Um, check into it. Um, you can inspect how each of the 12 Agile principles was implemented. Um, you can look to see if there's a training program that all staff were put through to train them on what the heck Agile is. And then of course, how those principles are applied to infrastructure um, if, if uh, the team is reporting that DevOps is being used, okay? Um, now I wanna transition to the types of projects because all project types can fail. You know, we have Greenfield, we have legacy modernizations, and then we have just projects that started out as one of these or a mix, but we're just doing ongoing development. We're continually development. You know, Greenfield, a lot of people love Greenfield. They're the ones that are brand new. They aren't upgrades, they aren't modernizations, they aren't integrations with a, a merger of companies. They're new systems where no system has existed for this function before, either because it's a, you know, maybe new business process, or maybe because the previous process wasn't automated or digitized. And these projects are very common in growing companies because the pace of change is, is could be more constant. The new ideas are flowing. All the, the software engineers and developers, they love these type of projects because there's no baggage from the past to contend with. Um, and, more naive software engineers love them because it's another opportunity to start over and attempt to quote, do it right this time, end quote. Maybe avoid some of the mistakes of the last project. Whereas more competent software engineers love them because they're eager to succeed again, just like they have become used to. Um, and so maybe that's a little bit fodder when you, when you interview software engineers. With a greenfield project, you really should expect the team to be able to have some deployed segment of the chosen architecture, have it online, have it deployed and demonstrated really within the first week of the first line of code being written. Um, and we're, we're not gonna cover implementation sequences here in this webinar, but as an executive that's overseeing your project, the longer, this is what you should look for, the longer the delay between the first line of code and the first interactive demonstration to you, the higher risk you have for the entire project. The beginning of the project kind of sets the norms for the entire thing. And remember, one of the Agile principles 
It's working software is the primary measure of progress. So until there is working software, there is no progress. All right, the secondary measures only account for anything after you have the primary measure. That's super, super important. Now, um, a lot of you are probably doing projects around legacy modernization, some system that's been around for a long time, you need to upgrade some portion of it, make a meaningful change. And, and, and legacy in general, we call them that because they're the, they're the older systems. They're resistant to change um, and they're so resistant to this change that you actually had to commission a project to make big changes or maybe replace them. Now, it, if the piece of software could be changed easily, you wouldn't be calling it a legacy system. It would be a current system and you would be just doing ongoing development on it, no problem. But legacy systems are cursed by software engineers. It, software engineers hate legacy systems um, because they're hard to change. And if they change something and it breaks, well, now it's their problem. But it's important to realize that these software systems became legacy systems through a series of ineffective software leaders. Maybe there was deferred maintenance. Maybe there was architectural mistakes. Maybe there were Band-Aid patches. Maybe there was poor quality control uh, and invariably a combination of all of those. And they all contribute to a system deteriorating over time into a state of disrepair all the way to the point where any attempted repair or changing it becomes a big project. And now this isn't a new concept. Every business deals with this in machinery, in buildings, in any large physical asset. If the asset isn't maintained properly, it erodes eventually to the point where attempting to finally get it back up to the standard is an enormous undertaking. And, and if you do it right, then it keeps on working. Let's take the, let's take, um, dams all across all across the United States. There's big electric motors that open and close floodgates of dams. And around Austin, Texas, there's a big dam called the Mansfield Dam. And a company named Westinghouse installed the electric motors. And it was almost 100 years ago. And by being maintained properly, 100 years later, the floodgates and the motors operating the floodgates on the dam still work. Okay. So it, it doesn't mean that something old is always a legacy system. It's if we find that it's not in the proper state of repair, that's why we call it a legacy system, okay? All right. Um, in the software world, kind of getting away from the analogy of, of the physical, in the software world, um, just by uh, just by spending money on a software team, on a software development payroll, that doesn't automatically equate to a system that's kept up to date with proper maintenance. You have to inspect it. And, and in order to inspect it, you have to have a checklist. You have to have a defined maintenance schedule. Um, and you have, to, you have to know who is checking to make sure that it happened. And in a lot of cases, there's no maintenance schedule, there's no inspection checklist, there's no person assigned to do the checklist, there's no reporting of what we find for maintenance of the software system and the executives don't get informed and then something time passes and then something happens and all of a sudden we label it legacy and there's a recommendation bubbling up that we need to replace this system and the executives feel ambushed and it's like, where did this multi-million dollar expense come from? And it's a big old surprise. Uh, but unfortunately, that happens too often in the industry, but it doesn't have to. Okay. Um, now, let's tackle the third, the third one, ongoing development. There's, there's greenfield projects, there's legacy modernizations. Both are going to fall into periods of ongoing development once they get going. Ongoing development is kind of the natural destination. Even if it started greenfield or if it started with a legacy modernization objective, it's going to fall into ongoing development. And that's natural if you're applying the agile values and principles, um, because you can only plan within a certain horizon uh, when you start this initiative. 
and then you learn as you go and are planning the next step as you go. And it's just a rhythm of learning and planning, learning and planning. And that's, and that's fine. That that's what normally happens. Um, it's the natural rhythm. And, and this is another reason why implementing all of the advancements in agile and DevOps are so important because they include and, and the community that sprouted up around it and the learning over the last 20 years, they include proven engineering methods for keeping the quality high and operating the software in a stable fashion and accelerating the pace of software development over time. So if we're drifting into ongoing development, what are software projects? And the interesting thing is the concept of a project is becoming a thing of the past. Regular ongoing development is now the norm. Software teams that are funded and they just continue working and then priorities are just funneled into the team. That's now, that's now the norm. For the longest time, software features and capabilities, they were you know, requested by batching a lot of them together and then funding a quote, software project. And of course, We've seen how has that worked? You know, 39% um, su absolute success rate. Now, with, when you look at the small projects, you have a 60% success rate, fantastic. So the construct of a project, it really hasn't gained as much. It doesn't have a good track record. And with agile infrastructure, that is DevOps, and elastic cloud environments, the actual need for that construct, that project construct is less and less. And the Standish group has published the, you know, the poor track records for projects uh, that, that have the role of project manager leading them versus projects that did not have that role. And the epilogue of the 2020 chaos report from Standish, it kind of gave us some forward looking trend predictions. One of them is what they call infinite flow period and i call it just ongoing everybody calls it ongoing development but they named it infinite flow period where development is just going to be ongoing the the prediction because it's kind of already it's kind of already come to pass is that projects will be so small as to kind of go away uh, and the role of a formal project manager is less and less no actual project budgets no actual project plans just a budget for the cost of the development team and the server infrastructure, a cost for the pipeline, and then you funnel in requests, funnel in features into that team, uh, into that process. And I believe that the proper construct in this environment is to stream to the development team a feature or like an order for a feature rather than a project, because then by definition, we're just executing a string of small project, small project, small project, small project which have higher success rates. If you look at your software teams, I bet you you'll find that this is already happening in many of them. Some, some of the new big initiatives have projects or what's the project budget, what's the project team? Okay, it's gonna be for this period of time, but many teams already are, they're just working. They're just working and you ask stuff of them and they are doing ongoing development work with software users, customers and the like, and they're naturally drifting towards this because it's a, it's a more natural way of working. Whereas I think our industry is finding out that this construct of a project, as much effort as we put into it to define the notion of a project, was just hard in the first place. It didn't really work. And it hasn't given us the outcomes that we wanted. It hasn't given us the success rate that we need. And, and more and more, the industry has abandoned the notion of a software project and it, it, we use the word project out of habit, but it's not really that we're defining projects anymore. We just, it's another word for initiative and, and some, some type of goals. And so instead of, instead of resisting this change, consider its alignment with the industry stats and, and give it a thought. Because um, in ongoing development, working on small things piece by piece, it puts the team firmly in that small project category where the success rate goes up considerably. And of course, this brings back full circle the question, hey, who is leading the software initiative? Who's leading it? Now, you are, you are. Um, 
delegating to someone who is named a project manager expecting to gain success, the stats tell us that that we can't count on that. But it all comes back to you, software executives and executives who oversee software groups. Executives are organization leaders, and it's up to you to put your organization in, in an environment where they can succeed. Leaders are that rare individual with the ability to, to set up an organization for success. Your leadership shapes the software organization. All right, um, W. Edwards Deming, uh, he passed away in 1993, but he was a leader in the quality revolution after World War II. And he's published hundreds of papers, articles, and books. And one of his ideas is the Deming cycle, which is used in quality control. And he famously said, if you can't describe your plan, you don't know what you're doing. And um, the, the, the Deming cycle, or sorry, the, the Deming chain reaction, which some people call the, the Deming cycle, is all about doing something to make things better, improve quality. And then that has some causes. It reduces rework, fewer mistakes, fewer delays and snags. Uh, and it causes productivity to improve. Not that people were working harder, but if people have less rework and less mistakes, then they actually spend more of their time doing more productive things. And so when that happens, well, now your organization is more effective. And so you can capture market share. You can deliver better quality product or service to your customers. You can maybe lower the price. And as a result, your business does better. You can stay in business, your business grows. And when that happens, you hire more people and you provide more jobs. And then you can start the chain reaction over again, where now you have more people and more things going on and you can figure out more ways to improve things, improve quality and start the chain reaction all over again. That's what we want in our software engineering organizations. And so I talked a little bit about Agile and DevOps and poor implementations, but also how that alone doesn't, doesn't avoid failure. Let's talk about what goes on organizationally that puts, that puts a lot of teams on the path towards failure. And, and, and that is a tax on productivity. Um, there's an article published on computerworld.com that shows that most engineers spend nearly a third of their week in meetings, meaning a third of their week not really working on the software at all. And six hours in fragmented time, checking email, doing administration, jumping from thing to thing to thing, and only 20 hours on focus time. And of course, this you can, you can see the math. This only accounts for 37 hours of a possible 40-hour week. But it shows that basically uh, people on our software team are only focused for somewhere in the neighborhood of half of their time. So already we've got this big old tax. Now there are categories of work. Um, there's working on the new software, there's diagnosing or fixing or reworking past work that we thought was done, um, or maybe we're fixing the software as it runs in production, things going wrong. Then there's administrative, non-software work, other things we do as a company. And then of course, there's time off. Uh, now, the working on new software, this is where we want to maximize the effort. We want all of our team to be working on new software or valuable changes. Um, and, and this is really what our internal and external customers are asking for. They think our team is spending all of its time on this category, but in reality, some of the teams are struggling to get time to work in this category at all, depending on how bad the defect rate is. Um, but, but this category does include absolutely everything in the software development life cycle. Even talking about the vision for a new feature is part of this category. Doing the architecture prototypes and design uh, and talking about options for new changes. Well, that's a part of this category, it's good. Doing routine maintenance on our software to keep it uh, in a state of good repair and working well. That's in this category, that's good. Even something as mundane as renewing a security certificate um, for, for a dot .com, that's in this category. It's, it's expected important work. It's work that we can see, work that we can forecast. Um, and, and this is the type of work that software engineers and architects sign up for. The other categories of work that the team has to do 
in order are things that they have to do so that they can get back to this work. We want to optimize this category. The diagnosing or reworking or fixing all this, that is absolute waste. This is when we realize that something is broken, something we thought was done is not actually done. Software that was supposed to work in a certain way, it doesn't. Something is missing. Or maybe we're surprised that now that thousands of users use our software, the computing performance in some of the areas is absolutely terrible. We didn't count on some database tables growing to the size that they've grown to. And now the queries really don't work and are hanging. Or maybe we're spending time figuring out why we have some problem and we're just churning and churning. And then once we've reproduced the problem, we are trying to redesign something in the software so that we fix the problem. And we lament that we didn't catch the problem earlier because now it's sucking up our week. Or maybe we just made a change and something else in a seemingly unrelated part of the software just broke. And we don't actually understand how this could possibly be related, but it is. Um, and and so anyone, any one of you that's been in software for a while, you understand these dynamics. Defects kill effectiveness and they are a recipe for failure, okay? It's common knowledge that a defect that escapes into production is 10, 100, sometimes more than 100 times more costly to resolve than a defect that's found very close to when it was created. And this isn't new. Uh, back in 1976, Barry Bohm, who's a distinguished professor and a software engineer, he published a paper in the IEEE Journal and it was simply stated software engineering at the time, but it, it, part of this paper, he laid out findings for the huge increase in the cost of fixing defects the further from the source the defect traveled. And the you know experience of several generations of software professionals since then kind of generally agrees that there is at least an order of magnitude difference in the cost as a defect escapes out of one team and into another, all right? Now, in 2018, uh, the company Stripe uh, published an, an interesting study because they did a lot of software projects. Uh, and the study had the title of the developer coefficient. And in this study, they found that the average developer spends at least 17 hours per week dealing with issues rather than building new features. And that's based on a full work week. Now, we know that developers are, are not 100% efficient working on work in the meetings area. Um, and and um, if we just round and, and simplify the numbers, we can quickly see how the findings of 17 hours a week working on issues is a significant blow to the productivity of our project team. And so if we round that to about half of their time trying to work and 17 hours of that, that it's probably more than half, but let's divide up the focus time into focused development and focused debugging. And now we see that we're down to 27% of the week actually working on development, okay? So we think our project team is working, but only 27% of available capacity is actually going to what we think and what we thought we were funding the work on. And, and this is not a software team that is destined for success. This is a software team that is on the road to failure. And regardless of number of features, we can clearly see that they're not on the road to success and we can do some things to change it. Now, let's dive into why we have such a huge cost for defects and, and then we can we can take steps to fix it. So um, let, let's let's run through an example. We have a defect that maybe was just generated by a programmer and it escapes out of the individual programmer's desk and out onto the team. And then the defect might escape from the team to product management and other teams within the company that are checking out the software. And then the defect may escape out into production to the customer. Every one of these boundaries is likely going to be an order of magnitude difference in the cost to find and fix and re-deliver a build that has the issue resolved. When a defect is found at a programmer's desk or before, even before code is written, or, or if it's even generated and, and it was found minutes after being caused, then the programmer can fix it quickly and move on. As soon as there's communication and coordination involved, 
meaning to the rest of the team, the price for that defect goes up. And besides the technical work, customer experiencing a defect in production, they've got to report the defect and describe it to whoever is working customer service for that piece of software. Then the customer service team has to reproduce and understand the defect enough to figure out if it's a maybe a user training issue or if it truly is a problem with the software and requires it to go back to the software engineering team or maybe a configuration change. Once the customer service team has exhausted all their available remedies and, and records, then the severity of the bug it has to be elevated and escalated to second level support, which most of the time is someone on the software engineering team. And then the software engineering team analyzes the problem and figures out if it's a configuration issue or a code issue. The defect is then assigned to a particular software engineer who makes the change that would fix the defect. Most of the time, finding out, most of the time spent, is finding out the right thing to do. That is the lion's share of the effort. The communication and transitioning between the teams is what takes so much time. And that results in the order of magnitude differences between a defect crossing these boundaries. There's another researcher named Capers Jones. I've spoke about quite a bit in, in other webinars, but he spent a great deal of his career analyzing quality and defects. And he has research that shows that uh, about 40% of defects are caused by problems with programmers or writing bad code. The other 60% of, of defects are caused in other parts of the software development lifecycle, including requirements, envisioning, uh, UI design, analysis, um, server configuration. And, and his research also shows that 9% of the time we fix a defect, we generate a new defect <laughs> while we're trying to fix one. So you can, you can quickly see that the software engineering capacity of our project team can easily get sucked up with, with just fixing problems and instead of delivering software features that, that we believe are necessary to solve the market problem that we think that we're investing in. We love firefighters. Firefighters are awesome, but firefighters don't build buildings. They try to minimize the destruction that's already happening. Too many software teams are firefighters. They have stopped building and all they're doing is fighting fires and trying to minimize the bad things that are happening. Software quality has to be the biggest priority for a software engineering team because it preserves the ability of the team to continue working on the software. As the number of defects continues to increase, the percentage of the entire team's capacity to even work on new features decreases. About uh, 50 years ago, Fred Brooks wrote a book of essays called The Mythical Man Month. And uh, you know, Fred Brooks was a software engineer on, on the early IBM OS 360 project back in the 50s. And one of the essays in the book is titled The Tar Pit. And the main idea of this analogy is that low quality software is like a tar pit. The more you fight it, the deeper you sink, no one single thing seems that difficult then you might be able to pull one foot out of the tar but you still can't get yourself out of the pit this is what happens when high quality is not established or rigorously maintained at a high level just ask your team if they feel like they're sinking in a tar pit where we're putting out a lot a lot a lot of effort and we just don't seem to be making progress so what should we do? Um, is, it, is, it, is it just quality? Is it just one issue? Is it just part of Agile? Is it just part of DevOps? Um, let's, start with, let's start with misalignment on what we're trying to accomplish. What's the purpose? What's the vision of the software release that we're working on? And some of the, some of the warning signs, if you get some answers kind of like this, then you really need to dig deeper. Hey, uh, we've already built our backlog and now we're working to burn it down. Or, um, we already know the features we need, or maybe we need to get more development done faster, or maybe uh, these are all required features, we need all of them, or the subject matter expert has said that we need to have these features, or this feature still doesn't work the way the product manager wants it. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to dispel a myth that's peddled by some software methodology trainers over the past few decades, and, and the myth, is that a person with the title of product owner 
or product manager has the right answers for what features to build in order to accomplish the vision of the project. In one of my books, .NET DevOps for Azure, which by the way, if I mentioned, uh, if you'd like an electronic copy, just, just let us know. Um, I related some research from 2018 that debunks this myth. And, and what was found is roughly a one third, one third distribution. There's three things. One third of the time that a product manager or product owner, uh, you know, prioritized a feature, one third of the time that feature when put in production did have a positive intended effect and it was all good. One third of the time that feature didn't really have any effect on the overall outcome at all. We built it, it's in production, but either people aren't using it or really it didn't move the needle. And then one third of the time we built and put a feature into production, it had a negative effect and we had to back it out really, really quickly. Okay, so that means that only one third of the time this, this uh, you know, mythical role of product owner or product manager had the appropriate wisdom to you know, unilaterally come up with the right features to build. Software teams that are organized around this myth, inherently, they take on 200% more work than is actually necessary to accomplish the goal. That's on top of whatever rate of defects and support issues uh, that, that, that we just discussed. And so you can, you know, you can detect this mismanagement with the quotes here on the screen and you can see the language. All of these statements appeal to an authority outside the team for why the feature is being built in the first place. It exempts the people inside the team from connecting what they're doing, from connecting their present work with the vision of the project. And it forbids questioning if a feature is even meaningful or even if the even the way a feature is to be implemented. You know, engineers in general, they typically develop a keen creative skill for problem solving. And if the problems given to the engineers are always at the level of a software feature, then a good deal of that skill is being wasted. And so in order to align everyone around the around the same vision, the right purpose and, and have clarity there, you have to make sure that every team member knows the vision and believes the vision and is constantly course correcting daily tasks, everything that's happening to be in absolute alignment with that vision. Um, and we have a, we have a resource for that. that I'll share at the, at the end of the webinar, but if, if only 40% of the defects are from code, what about the other 60% of the defects? Um, defects are, pretty much guaranteed and encouraged by bad software process of you know vision misalignment disconnects a process that lumps in multiple activities in a single named stage is, is really going to mask defects and make it harder to discover until the destructive impacts of them are already being felt for example if the stages of your software development life cycle and your project are just not started or in development and done and that's that's all you have then you're not going to be able to notice defects before they've already become costly and again this is the 60 percent of defects that are not code problems uh, by separating out more stages like you see on the screen you give yourself more signals for detecting if defects are being generated in a particular stage if if an item of work has to go backwards in the process then you have just discovered a defect the general software development life cycle is designed to work in a linear fashion from, from left to right. Um, and, and the Kanban style of work tracking board is pretty much well implemented across the industry. But this, this process assumes that work is complete and of high quality in a particular stage as it moves to the next stage. If, if an item of work has to move backwards in the process, then that's because some piece of work that we thought was finished is not really as quite as it should be. And, and this condition has to be our definition of a defect. It's an internal defect. It's not, a, it's not a, a customer reported defect, but it has to be in our definition of a defect. Either something is missing or it is not as it should be. And the research we've examined earlier shows us that the defects can occur with, with any activity in a software project. Just look at the research of Capers Jones. He kind of details it in uh, detail. If a software engineer is writing the code for a particular feature, 
and then realizes that a mock-up drawing of a particular screen um, is missing, hasn't been created, then, then this is a defect in the stage for user interface design or user experience. And that stage wasn't done completely. Uh, or for example, deciding how a screen should look could be part of analysis and design. If the mock-up is missing and we haven't decided how the screen should look, then we have a problem in the part of our process where we should have made that decision. And we're not really ready for code yet. So there's nothing, the there's no right thing the developer can do except kick it back in the process because we didn't finish the stage. If we don't stop the line and fix that defect immediately, then the look of that particular screen is really gonna be up to the individual personality and maybe experience of the person who happens to be writing the code and makes a guess. And inevitably a downstream party is not going to like some of the elements on the screen and is going to send it back with a bug report of some sort. And now we have the recipe for rework. It's far too common for this to happen when there is schedule pressure, especially on the project. Um, but but when when is there not schedule pressure, really? There always is. And that's where you come in as an experienced software leader who has gained hard, hard fought wisdom in how to deliver software. You know that even with the schedule pressure, allowing slips in quality is going to waste valuable portions of the schedule that you're not going to get back. You need the entirety of the schedule that's available to go towards delivery of software features and not fixing defects, not fixing problems or reworking undone work. The only way to do this is by preventing almost all defects from escaping an individual's desk while working on one of these stages of the software development life cycle. All right, as we as we close up, um, we want all of you to succeed. And it's kind of a five part formula. You create clarity so that everyone's going in the right direction. Then you make sure that you establish a high level of quality right away and keep it there so that you don't generate more work for yourself in the form of defects. Then you make sure that the software is st stable in production and get there quickly because that can also generate rework. And then you optimize the process by which you flow work through your team. And over time, you continually increase speed. And once you've implemented these concepts, then you settle into a rhythm of leading your team and reinforcing all of those. And when you have a change, you go back and reinforce one of them. Um, so we have some tools that are available. We have a, a team alignment template that'll help you create clarity. We have an effectiveness assessment on the clearmeasure.com website that will help you uh, figure out maybe the hot spots in your software organization to focus on first. And we also have a Microsoft Excel template for a software team scorecard that you can implement for a software team to uh, have a good report up to the executive level. And then we have several guides on our website. We have the software leaders handbook, and then we have um, we have success for business critical software projects. It's another it's another mini book on our website. Um, those are all resources that we would encourage you to uh, to make use of. And of course, I want to highlight again the the assessment clearmeasure.com slash assessment. And that'll quickly get you a sense of maybe what the hot spots that you need to prioritize to work on on your team. And as always, we love um, having such a, a, a big group um, in our webinars. I think I was able to answer um, all the questions that came through in line as I was going through the material. The next webinar we have on our schedule is May 7th. And it the, the, the topic there is is how to conquer the causes of slow software delivery. Uh, you, we, we recognize that, that many businesses are, and more and more businesses all the time, are funding internal software development teams. And the industry as a whole still isn't happy with the pace of software development. And there's some, there's some common things that you can do to, to speed up development. So this, this webinar aims to go over those common categories uh, and, and, and help your team succeed. So, um, I think the last question I answered in the last segment, which is awesome. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for, for coming to this webinar. It was great. And thank you to the people who offered some insightful questions. I was able to kind of add to the content and, um, man, God bless you. Have a great day.